Hey, this is Luke Maxfield. I'm a tutor with Med School Coach. I tutor for USMLE 2, 3, and Comlex 1, 2, and 3. We're going to take a look at a question today, just go through the vignette, look at some distinguishing features and a couple of different diseases. The first one, a six-year-old girl comes into the emergency department with fevers and a rash. The mother reports that it had been present for six days, has gotten worse. The pulse is 100 beats per minute. The blood pressure is 100 over 65. The respiration rate is 20 per minute. The patient has injected sclera, swollen red tongue, erythematous hands with superficial desquamation, and then we have some clinical, clinical images provided. What is the most appropriate A, B, and C? So with each disease entity, one, hopefully by the time you're going through the vignette, you've got an idea in mind about what the disease is, especially if you're looking at a question stem and there are images provided. If you can get through an image quickly, you're oftentimes gonna be thinking of the right answer before you even look at the distractors. And you can answer these questions in 15, 30 seconds and save some time for those longer vignettes that you may need time for later in the exam. So with this question stem, looking at some of the key features, we have a six-year-old girl, fever, rash, present only recently. The vital signs are largely within normal limits. Again, a nice way to also save time without memorizing everything. Pediatric patients, basically the vital signs are just not outlandishly toxic, or they're just a little bit faster than what you have memorized and consider normal for an adult patient. Here with a physical exam is notable for injected sclera, swollen red tongue, erythematous hands, with superficial desquamation. So now let's look at the images. So we see here the hand is kind of as the vignette described with erythematous confluent patches. We see disquamation at the fingertips. And then the tongue is very characteristic, and even the mouth surrounding the tongue is characteristic. So looking at the tongue, we see that it's very erythematous with prominent edematous white papillae. And it's that constellation that is termed the strawberry tongue. Now, while strawberry tongue isn't specific for one disease in particular, it shortens the list tremendously to just a few. Additionally, if you look at the mouth here, we actually see some fissures or radial lines actually within and involving the lip mucosa itself while the perioral area is spared. So with this constellation, your mind probably should be going to one place in particular, and that's Kawasaki disease. So with this one, it's important to know that the disease is diagnosed clinically. So before anything else, you begin treatment. We'll talk about what that treatment is as well. After a treatment is initiated, the most appropriate next step or the most appropriate next step in diagnosis is going to be the echocardiography. These patients and all of the morbidity and mortality associated with this disease is from coronary aneurysms. And these aneurysms can be seen in echocardiography. And if you follow some of the established algorithms, it takes you there as soon as you suspect the diagnosis. And then what's the most appropriate treatment? Just one of those things you need to know is that it's a combination of aspirin and IVIG. This is one of the few, if not the only instance in which aspirin is going to be given to pediatric patients because the risk of Ray's syndrome is outweighed by the benefits of decreasing the risk of the coronary arteries and myocardial infarctions. So looking at Kawasaki disease specifically, otherwise known as mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome, this is a systemic inflammatory and vasculitic disease of childhood with prominent clinical findings, mostly mucocutaneous. And it's because that these findings are able to be seen on physical exam and the diagnosis is made clinically and there's associated mortality from the disease. It's something that's very highly tested. So of affected patients, up to 25% can have myocardial infarctions and then cardiac aneurysms. In epidemiology, it's most common in Japanese or those of Japanese ancestry, but it can be seen in Caucasians. And again, this is a disease of childhood predominantly. And then there's a mnemonic associated with this just to help us remember some of those clinical findings crash and burn, conjunctival injection, rash, adenopathy, classically cervical lymphadenopathy, the strawberry tongue that we've pointed out and looked at before, hand and foot rash, which can start with just erythema, edema, and later desquamation, and fever, which is the burn part of the acronym. And then the fever should have been present for greater than or equal to five days. So the diagnosis of the disease is made with greater than or equal to four of the clinical findings. And if you have that, that's enough to begin treatment and order the echocardiogram. But again, when taking the test and looking at diseases that can kill a person quickly, a lot of times, and in this case, you need to begin the treatment before waiting on any extra lab results or imaging. So if you had both options and you had to select one, it would be to begin treatment first, especially if it led you with best initial. So the treatment, again, being aspirin and IVIG, 
and dosing is not tested. So one thing to not get caught up on is that the presence of a strawberry tongue, like I mentioned earlier, is not specific for Kawasaki disease. And in fact, strawberry tongue can be seen in Kawasaki disease, staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, streptococcal scarlet fever. And so you have to have a good knowledge base about other diseases and other distinguishing findings. So looking at Kawasaki disease, another classic feature that they bring up is that erythema, edema, and late desquamation of the hands. But this is also found in other things, such as toxic shock syndrome. And then you can have the erythema, but not necessarily the swelling seen with staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. So then with Kawasaki disease, we know that it has conjunctivitis as a prominent feature, but classically with limbal sparing. So what it looks like is let's say we have the eye here, and then we'll draw the iris blue, and then we'll come back to red, showing the conjunctival injection. There's going to be an area actually of sparing right around the iris, and that's highly characteristic. And that can help you distinguish this from some other diseases that also have conjunctivitis, especially toxic shock syndrome or even TEN, which can also have conjunctivitis. Now, when we looked at the mouth of that child with Kawasaki disease, we also saw that lips were prominently involved. And that's a subtle finding that if they're fissuring or chapping of the lips themselves, that's a distinguishing feature which separates this from some of these other diseases. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome can have perioral radial fissuring. So let me draw an example of what that looks like. So let's say here's the lips. The fissuring is adjacent to, but classically not touching the lips. It's going to be sparing that immediate perioral area, and the lips themselves are not going to be involved, which is the opposite of what you saw with Kawasaki disease. And then also, characteristic features of staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is most notably the superficial spreading of skin, and then this constitutional and systemic response with high fever, malaise, tender skin as well. Toxic shock syndrome is mediated by the superantigen production from staphylococcal species, and although it causes the erythema edema and the late desquamation and the strawberry tongue, the most prominent distinguishing feature here is going to be the hemodynamic instability. Also, it's less common in this age group in that we had historically the menstrual and non-menstrual variants, but it has been classically associated with tampon use and nasal packing, both of which are not regularly used or not used at all in the pediatric population. Then hand, foot, and mouth disease, although it involves both the mouth and the hands. In the mouth, you get oral erosions, and you can also get some vesiculation in the mouth. Often those vesicles are ruptured and you're just left with these clean-based erosions reminiscent of an aphis ulcer. But on the palms and soles, it's mostly erythematous vesicles. And streptococcal scarlet fever, again, has the strawberry tongue. But again, looking around the mouth, we have a characteristic feature, and you have perioral pallor. So drawing the same lips, instead of fissuring around the lips or fissuring on the lips, basically you're going to have a mild erythema, kind of of the face, just diffuse patches of erythema but it spares that area adjacent to the mouth. And so the skin in between the lips and the erythematous face is gonna look relatively spared. And then these patients also have petechia in the flexural areas, especially the antecubital fossa, and they can have a sandpaper-like rash, and then purulent pharyngitis consistent with the group A strep cause. And then TEN is classically associated with that sloughing of thick skin. And then they can have any mucosal involvement which can involve or include conjunctivitis or oral disease.